Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson. Joining me now is Frank Holmes, the CEO of U.S. Global Investors and Chief Investment Officer. The first thing I want to talk about, because I just had Gordon Chang in this chair, the author of Coming Collapse of China, and you two are going to have a debate about China. So I want to start off on that point, and I'm not going to be the one to, uh, to debate. You're not going to debate through me, but I do want to get your take on China because you're really bullish on the country. Why? Well, I think it's so helpful to have in a normal market, a free market is a bid and ask. So you need to see where the strengths and weaknesses. And I think what Gordon Chang is doing is, is providing this other part. Uh, it is not so pervasively negative. that like you can paint this picture of any place in the world. And I think there's another factor to consider. But it's very healthy to have this sort of view that he has. Well, and one of the things that he talked about is some of the reasons behind what he sees, and he's calling for the, the coming collapse in the next year or two years, is this weakening economic data, the falling apart of the banking sector, and the slowing growth. Do, when you look at the numbers, do you see the same thing? No. Okay, tell me why. Because I, I see um, a huge, big program out to, to develop their economy, and, and within that, there's going to be lots of glitches and mistakes that take place. Uh, their process of every time there's been a, a, a tragic accident or whatever, they're very quick to come in to deal with that issue and get on with life because they have a big program. Uh, the Communist Party is fascinating to me because there's two things that are very key to them. Social stability, especially since Deng Xiaoping. Social stability and a means for financial independence. So everything they do in the fine tuning and they go a little mistake to the right, a little to the left in driving that car down the road, but they're not whipsawing all over the highway. They're basically adjusting that steering wheel on a regular basis. Social stability, and so when there are a riots or, or protests in the street, they're not ignored. They, they, they meet and discuss because they know the significance of the Communist Party staying in power is not to have social unrest. Okay, I want to ask you a lot more questions about China, but I'm going to leave that for you and Gordon Chang to have your debate. But let's bring it closer to home. You still see a real growing demand from China. What kind of impact will that have on North American commodities? Well, it's, it's, I believe it's not just China. Uh, it is so many of the other places of the world. Uh, Saudi Arabia, and see what was taking place in North Africa, immediately announced a uh, hundred billion dollar real estate program to deal with the men that they had homes to stay in, basically a co-op housing. Co-op housing we have in downtown Toronto. Uh, co-op housing is to try to help those with different income levels to cooperate and live together and to still have a great outcome. A uh, hundred billion dollars? Uh, you know, what, what is the demand for rebar, for steel, cement? Uh, you start adding those, those, that recycling of their petrol dollars. The real important part is what do they do with those petrol dollars? What does China do with their savings of selling products around the world? And there's a lot of anti-China for the iPad, for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the total dollar value of, of the iPad, all the components and parts, is only seven cents on the dollar? So well, you pay a lot more for that. You, you? do. <laughs> you but, but the issue is, is not all parts are from China. They come from Japan, they come from Taiwan, they come from the U.S., and they're assembled in China. China built, back in the 80s, super ports, so they can easily have ships come and move in out products and small manufacturing units. So a lot of that trade, it shows that we were buying the whole $600 worth of iPad from China, when really, it's very little of their economic activity. So what does that mean then for some of the people who are here at Cambridge House, for the Vancouver Resource Companies, for these junior minor mining companies? What does this kind of demand from Asia, not just from China as you mentioned, but what does that mean for them? What well, means that, that the cost, what's important is that it was only in 1974 the EPA was set up in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the EPA has grown and grown and grown and it's so important to have clean air and clean water. But many of the NGOs that are involved in that end of it, it's, it's, they just do not want any pro, pro, uh, progress, is the operative word here. Mm -hmm. So the world continues to have babies, and governments continue to want to be in power. The Communist Party wants to stay in power. They have to create jobs. If they don't create jobs, then they'll have social instability. So there's a whole traction. The best way for them to do that is to create infrastructure projects. Uh, that are not bridges going to nowhere, that there's something of substantial to connect people throughout their country. Uh, you're seeing the same thing happen in India, you see it in Vietnam, uh, uh, in, uh, Thailand, same, same sort of model build out. So I don't think that that's going away. So that's very bullish for the many of these uh, companies here looking for commodities. 
because the cost of, of exploration, of developing, producing and shipping any commodity has gone up dramatically and the world's population has doubled. So therefore, the supply of looking for the commodities to meet that demand is always going to be very tight. Yeah, there are very different market conditions now than there were even 10 years ago, even five years ago. Very different. And you're seeing that the environmental costs continue to rise. Every mm -hmm. time there's an accident, it just get, it goes higher and higher. Uh, but people continue to have babies. But people, this whole process of the world is not going away. I think the, one of the big things, that if you're looking at worries and crisis, could be water. I think, I think the water is going to be a very significant asset class in 20 years from now. Maybe so you, you see that there's some opportunity there as well then? Huge opportunity. Yeah. But I think all the other resources are going to be, but people also have to recognize that, that there's high risk for exploring. And what is the math of that? And, mm -hmm. and how many people will be able to, what's the track record of management? Uh, where in the life cycle of finding a, a mine and developing it? Uh, all those parts are really key for investors. That's really the key thing, isn't it? For investors, when they're looking at some of these uh, junior mining companies, for example, um, to try and break down some of the data to decide who they might want to invest in and who they might not to. Some of those key things are things like who's running the company and how it's being done. Tell me more about what you look for then. Well, two things, you know, try to make it simple. There's, uh, there's two real key things is what's the track record of management? Mm -hmm. What have they done? And it's a very competitive space like athletes looking for capital, looking for projects that requires a innovative, smart, competitive mindset. Uh, and you can ask them and you can get so much public disclosure on their track record. Two is that they have something. If they have something in the ground, relative valuation. Like when you go shopping at Loblaws and you want to compare, how easy can you compare the soaps? How easy can you can compare any product and the pricing you're paying per ounce? That's very important. Same thing you can do with these companies. How many pounds of copper they have per share, or how many ounces of resources do they have per share. And you get enough of them, you can get, create a relative valuation. And what about geopolitical factors, um, where they're operating, and the kind of impacts that uh, come from some of the political changes that are going on in, in particular areas of the world? It's a great question. And what you find when you do this relative valuation, an ounce of gold in Kazakhstan is not an ounce of gold in British Columbia. Even though the final ounce of gold has the same purchasing power, the exploration development is very, very different. So, uh, so that you do see that you look at a company in a relative valuation and go, wow, that looks so inexpensive. Then you find out it's in the Congo. Then you find out you know, it's, it's in a high risk country area. That's why it's at that discount. But you need to do this relative valuation. Okay, you brought up gold, and that's good, because I wanted to ask you about gold. You recently said that you thought 2012 is going to be a huge year for gold. How big a year? Over the past 10 years, the, the normal sort of, I like to call the volatility of gold. It's been a non-event, 70% of the time to go up 15%, down 15%. Anytime it goes up 30%, and it's done that many times within the year, it, quick, it quickly falls 15 to 20%. So you get the higher highs and the big corrections. So it is a non-event for gold to go 15% from these price levels. And last year this time, in fact, it went up 30% from these price levels. Uh, so that's just looking at the math. I do not see any real changes in most of the governments in the world to start paying high interest rates because they have so much debt to roll over in the G7 countries. And all of Europe has so much, I mentioned in my presentation, that America has $3 trillion just to roll over. Japan has $3 trillion just to roll over. And Europe has another, so sorry, three, two, and three. We have $8 trillion of money that has to be rolled over. And then the best way for governments to basically just to destroy uh, the currency is to monetize it, and that's what they're doing. They're giving you, they say, buy my currency, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay you one-tenth of one percent, but inflation's running at four. So where do you see gold going in the near term? So historically, whenever that happens, and the magic number is two percent over the inflationary rate, so you would have to have interest rates in America go to six percent. I don't see that happening. So I see that gold will trade higher, along with the printing of money to facilitate these governments from rolling over their debt levels. Last week, 30-year mortgage in the U.S. at an all-time low. Do you think this is a long-term trend then for gold? I think it's a long-term trend for sure. 
I really, I do, and I think it's a, it, what would derail it would be two things. A rise of interest rates over 2% over the inflation, and emerging countries seeing shrinking GDP per uh, capita. And you don't see that happening right I now? Don't see it. I see that the governments in many emerging countries have real infrastructure projects in place. They're trying to get caught up and be where we are. Uh, and at the same time to do that, they're having printing of money. Uh, and I think that that's going to continue. Rising GDP per capita, higher consumption of gold. A big fact we saw it in China. They raised the minimum wage. What did that do? Food inflation and all of a sudden the consumption of gold. So when you're looking at gold and you're looking at uh, the different markets, we talked about gold isn't worth as much in one place as it is another. Is there a particular area of the world that you're most interested in? It, 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 it rotates around mm -hmm. as you go through different cycles, etc. I'd be very interested to see what happens in Russia after the elections, uh, which are only a few months away. Uh, because Russia has huge opportunity on the upside, uh, but the Putin stamp now is, is create a lot of negativity, and sometimes that provides great opportunity upside. Uh, Turkey, uh, if oil prices fall to $70 a barrel, uh, the Turkey manufacturer, and a lot of clothes you buy, Hugo Boss, they're all made in Turkey. Uh, huge huge uh, GDP growth, uh, great economy, uh, gold production. The gold producer that you have, can buy in Turkey, it, it, make, it grows as 10% of revenue, 20% has the highest returns on capital in the world for a gold producer. So when you look at what's going on in Europe and the, the kind of nervousness about that, maybe that's the, the question, is really how much does the nervousness and the perception of what's going on impact what's happening globally? It's huge. It's huge. I mean, it's an incredible uh, disaster already because you have a monetary union but no fiscal union. So it's, a, it's like a couple and one has it's been spending money and all of a sudden the other, the spouse finds out their credit card debts are so high. Now there's going to be, a, is there going to be a divorce? Are they going to reconcile? How are they going to do that? So can they hold those countries together? Will they split up? Uh, all that drama is creating an unknown uh, in the marketplace and that unknown creates greater volatility. But we have seen though, in the past 10 years, is the second half of the year has increased volatility. So what do you tell investors then when they're trying so, to wade through these? That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Mm -hmm. This is that, is that there's a symptom of the market from formation of capital worldwide uh, from Glass-Steagall Act, and now you're going to have the Volcker Rule. All these factors have an impact on the formation of capital to create jobs. And as it becomes more and more regulated, the ability for free markets to create jobs changes. And we are seeing with that, in the second half of each year now, this huge volatility, and people confuse it with these other issues. Uh, the other thing is to watch Japan. Japan is very, very significant. It, it, and every time their currency has a big, big move on a daily basis, you can see this rippling effect in capital markets around the world for six weeks to six months. And this past year, on August the 4th, there was the, what we call a five standard deviation move in the Japanese yen. And people were boring inexpensively in Japan, and they're investing in commodities, they're investing in other countries, dividend paying stocks, etc. They're buying all these other equities. And all of a sudden, Japan wants that money back. This rippling effect, sell, 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 money going back to Japan. They did it again in October. Then all of a sudden, you saw the sell down take place. If you go back to the Asian crisis in 97, the Jap Japanese wanted their money back. And the Thais said, we can't give you skyscrapers. They valued the currency. So you can see that Japan is very, very significant because people are borrowing at an inexpensive rate to invest in higher yielding investments around the world and we get these sneezes. In 06, when we were the number one, one gold fund in the world that year, won the award for, uh, as, a, as a mining uh, analyst, we saw huge inflows coming into the funds. We saw gold and gold stocks go up four standard deviation moves, and Japan took in May of 06, $200 billion back in the end. That created a multiplying banks lend out five times that number. One trillion dollars for the next four months, emerging markets and all the gold stocks got clobbered. So before I let you go, one last question about the debate I have to ask you. What's going to be your main message when you're debating Gordon Chang tomorrow? Optimism. Okay. Optimism and understand to be a realist that there'll be, you know, that the world's coming to an end and Japan's going to fall, China's going to fall off a cliff. That's not my scenario because I have to manage money every day. The summation of my decisions are very different of how I look at the world. 
and I like to have lots of risk controls, but I know innovation, creation, uh, jobs, all this stuff come from a competitive, innovative society. And to have that, you need to have optimism and you need to have hope. Can't wait for you to debate Gordon Chang. Frank Holmes, thanks very much Thank for joining you. us. That was great. It's going to be a